It's definitely in you! Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The UK has voted to leave the European Union. The United Kingdom, by leaving the European Union with a famous Brexit referendum, has made some analysts debate what would the plan be from now on. Their economy, like all the countries in the world, is directly connected to their immediate neighbors and the UK is just too reliant on the EU to simply replace it. Roughly 43% of their total global exports are with the Union and their imports even greater, with a figure jumping to 52%, more than half. The consequent changes in policies led to increased taxation, bureaucracy and trade complexity, which made all the products and services in the country jump in price and lower their availability. But the politicians that pushed for the exit must have predicted this, right? They surely knew that life without the European states would be harder. Yes, they can now be completely independent from the European rules and policies and finally have total control over their borders and subsequent immigration, but this sovereignty has to come with a cost. Some argue that the UK was never fully integrated into the EU, they always managed to have their own identity and fully denied the adoption of the common currency, sticking with British pounds rather than the euro. Nevertheless, the country still made the euro stronger when the two were together, and the future of the two unions is still uncertain. One thing is certain though, the UK won't be alone. New treaties will be signed, relationships created and trade routes explored. The country that gave birth to the biggest global power the world has ever seen is now turning their attention back to the glories of the past. The kingdom on which the sun never sets is now thought to be looking for the old colonies once more. The British Empire that once ruled the global sea trade together with other great empires like the Portuguese and the Spanish is now trying to be revived. Nowadays, the relationship with the colonies and their respective empires are, well, to put it lightly, a bit complicated. Some countries, like Portugal for example, now try to have progressive coalitions between their respective colonies. It even created several communities to promote this cooperation, namely the Palop community that connects all the Portuguese-speaking countries in Africa, like Angola and Mozambique, among others, and the CPLP, that connects all of the above, plus Brazil and Timor-Leste, to form a community with all the Portuguese-speaking countries in the world, but more on that on a later video. When it comes to Britain, they too have this type of communities, and honestly, even better ones. They have created the famous British Commonwealth, which is an association of 54 countries mostly previous colonies, that work towards the shared goals of prosperity, democracy and peace. It varies between nations, but overall, the integration and cooperation between them is an example to follow. Just to show you how united this community is, they even have sports championships and cups between them, like the Commonwealth Games, in order to celebrate and promote the union between their people. As I said, Relationships vary between the states in the Commonwealth, but it has created the early sources of a possible great future. Another possible solution is to deepen the Kanzuk Alliance. Formed together with Canada, New Zealand, Australia and the UK, this coalition has the objective to create a unified military group that can join the armed forces between the nations by focusing their objectives in common goals, share the same foreign interests and act on international affairs together. This includes increased trade, foreign policy cooperation and mobility of citizens between the four states, tied together by similar economic systems, social values and political and legal systems as well, in addition to speaking English. The idea is lobbied by advocacy group Kanzuk International and largely supported by British conservatives. Other supporters include think tanks such as the Adam Smith Institute, the Henry Jackson Society, Bruges Group and politicians from the four countries. What makes these countries closer and with better relationships with each other could be the fact that compared with the other countries from the Commonwealth, they were heavily populated by UK immigrants and their population is predominantly white, which let's be honest, 
Back then, it was a big factor. If the countries decide to deepen this alliance and maybe create a new United Kingdom, it will become a true titan in the world's economy, becoming the largest country in the world by area, with 18,000 km squared, the tenth when it comes to population, with 137 million, and the third richest, with a combined total of 7.8 trillion for the GDP. To put that into perspective, it would be more powerful than India, Brazil and Russia combined. It would also have immense resources with incalculable value. 100 billion would be the new defense budget, making it the third military powerhouse on the planet. But this money might not even be enough, because despite the fact that trade routes between Canada and the UK are well secured in the North Atlantic, the routes between Canada and the Oceania brothers will be right in the middle of the up-and-coming Chinese military. This, combined with the fact that Russia is also a major player in the Pacific Ocean, would leave the Southern Hemisphere nations vulnerable. At the moment, the close relationships with the US makes the stability in the Pacific a great factor in favor of them, but we cannot assure this would last forever. Speaking of the United States, they too were rumored to be a part of this alliance, but much like the UK thinks it's too big to be in the EU, the US think it's too big to be in the Anglosphere. An alliance not led by them is not even on the table. But they too are concerned about this future instability in the Pacific, and therefore have created the AUKUS Pact, that combined with a Quad Alliance, creates a military coalition with Japan, India, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, and the US, with South Korea and Taiwan close by. If you take another look, you notice that these countries also form the majority of the G7, with only Italy, Germany and France being left out. But this doesn't mean they are not part of the drama. Italy might be pretty quiet due to their crippling economy and overall crisis, but France is constantly flexing their muscles when it comes to geopolitics, with recent shows of strength in the South China Sea military exercises in the Indian Ocean together with the Indian government and the recent moves of Macron in the Ukraine war, but it is not all going smooth. If you paid attention to the news, you might remember the dispute France and Australia had with the nuclear-powered submarines deal, that, in the end, saw the Australian government ditch the French contract and go for the AUKUS arrangement that will see these war machines being built in a country with either UK or US designs, a big blow to France's foreign image. And lastly, but not least, Germany, that still has a lot of military limitations ever since the aftermath of World War II, but have recently announced the plans to become Europe's largest military, which certainly made a few people nervous in Europe, but more on these countries in a later video. An economic and defensive alliance is not the only thing unifying these countries, in fact, they even share an intelligence alliance, by the name of Five Eyes. They surveil the entire world, not only the enemies, and share information between each other in order to gain data advantage that could be used as leverage against other countries. But as all unions, there are benefits and there are drawbacks. One thing that the UK has going for it is the fact that Queen Elizabeth is already the head of states of all the Kanzuk states. Same legal system, same intelligence alliance, they all fought together in the same conflicts and have a pretty deep and shared history. On the other hand, the same reason that makes these countries with the potential of global powers is also the reason why this alliance could be a failure. Due to them being all in different continents, it makes their exports be dominated by regional countries putting the UK dependent on the EU, Canada tied to the US economy, and New Zealand reliant on Australia, which in this case is directly connected by almost a third of its economy to China. This inherent distance could very well create a massive sphere of influence if it all goes to plan, but it's not going to be easy. Another major issue and fundamental flaw is the lack of logistics. Three of the four members are islands, so their vulnerability in the sea trade means that such an alliance would only exist in a world where the US, Russia and China are happy to do so. If we look at the map, 
the cohesion of these nations could very easily become undone in a matter of days. As you can see, life outside of the EU will be very different for the UK. It might be better, maybe not, but one thing is certain. Either alone or together, it won't be easy for them. But as a great mind once said, they shall never surrender. The future of Europe seems in fact a little more unstable at the moment, with a lot of separatist movements arising and nationalist parties gaining ground. Another alliance that might take place is the Three Seas Initiative, that plans to join all central and eastern countries that are not major powers like Germany, into a solid European economic and possibly defensive union.